All right, so we've got 29 people. It's 7.05. I think you could uh, probably start. Okay, sounds good. Well, I will just share my screen. Um, share that. Can you just give me a quick thumbs up, Gary, if that looks good? Awesome, cool, thank you. So thanks so much everyone for coming tonight. I know there's lots of exciting things happening right now and spring is at least attempting to spring, at least here where I am in Southwestern Ontario. So it's, it's great that you're able to come and thanks to the, the Wilderness Canoe Association for letting me, me do this little event. Um, so I'm gonna talk about something that I've taken up largely as a hobby, but have also been tapping into as a professional um, in my, my professional life and kind of melding those two worlds. Um, there we go. Um, so I thought I'd just quickly introduce who I am and kind of where I'm coming from. Um, some of you have probably worked this out already from the way I speak that I grew up in Scotland. Um, I um, lived there for all of my childhood and then I did a PhD in South Africa on behavioral ecology of birds. So I spent about three years living in South Africa before moving to London, Ontario, in southern Canada, where I am right now in 2006. Um, shortly after that, I started working for the Nature Conservancy of Canada, and I'm still with them. I've been working for them for about 13 years now, and I'm currently the Director of Science and Stewardship for the Ontario region. I'm not here on behalf of the Nature Conservancy of Canada tonight, but I will be drawing on my professional experience here and there as a biologist. Um, and I, I guess the thing that you're probably all most interested in, given the, the nature of the organization, is that I'm you know, a highly experienced canoeist, having started less than a year ago. Um, on the 1st of July last summer was the first time that we had been canoeing, as it was the case for many other people, at least in Ontario, I'm sure. Um, I do, however, have pretty extensive backcountry and hiking and naturalizing experience from lots of parts of the world. So I'm not a complete newbie to the outdoors. Um, so, I'm going to just jump straight into this and um, those of you that hang out with me in the field will notice that I am often attached to my phone which is obviously a horribly unhealthy thing. We all tend to go to the wilderness to try to disconnect, to escape screen time and all of that stuff. But of course as many of you might be realizing technology can be an increasingly important tool for helping you in the wilderness. Um, it's great for health and safety. We use ours to connect our inReach device should we run into any difficulties in the backcountry. Um, we also may be able to use it for navigation. We use Gaia GPS where you can download all sorts of cool information to really help as an additional tool to, to navigating in the backcountry. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is the use of this kind of technology for community science. Um, so this is me in, in Quetico last August um, when we did a nine or 10 day backcountry canoe trip. Um, and while I'm swatting bugs on my ankle and looking at the view, I'm also fiddling around with my phone trying to identify a plant or something like that. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And before I lose half of you already, um, I will be talking about how you, there's no need to use a cell phone to do this work. Um, or to have this fun. Um, there's lots of other ways that you can tap into this cool stuff to help you learn a little bit about some of the, the neat creatures you might see in these places that you're all hopefully planning. Many of you may have heard it. It's essentially scientific research that's conducted in whole or in part by amateur scientists. And don't be put off by all of the use of the word science. I know um, many of us are, are not scientists and I count myself in that. Um, you don't need to have any expertise to do this. So that's why I'm here tonight to try and um, show you some ways that if you've never noticed any of the creatures around you, but you might be interested in learning a bit about them, you can tap into this the cool technology that we have now. Um, it's essentially a, a, a way to crowdsource huge amounts of data pertaining mostly to natural history, but also to the way people are using the outdoors now. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, in these crazy COVID times, working out how people are using the natural world is actually really important with many partner organizations. So it's greatly facilitated today by some really easy to use phone apps. Um, so again, there's no need to use a smartphone. So, so we're gonna talk through all of this. So, so don't switch off just yet. Um, but I'm gonna talk 
through um, my two favorite um, community science platforms and talk to you about some ways that, that you can all make use of these cool, cool things. So the first one I'm going to talk about is maybe my favorite. Um, it's called eBird. Um, it's run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And it's, it's just for birds. So if you see a bird out and about, then eBird is probably the best place that you can document that sighting. Um, so just birds like this um, long-tailed duck, red-winged blackbird, whatever you come across, you can pop your observations into eBird. Um, you need to be able to identify the birds yourself. So if you're not comfortable or confident identifying birds, then um, there's, a, a, there's an app for that, as they say. Um, you can either grab yourself a field guide and start learning some, some of the commoner birds, but there's also an app to help you identify birds. And I'm not gonna talk about that right now, but just be aware there's a thing called Merlin, which you can download and, and use it to help you ID a bird from photos or from the information that you were able to see. Um, it depends on volunteer reviewers to vet the quality of the data that, that we all submit. And it records how much time you spend looking for birds. So it's a really, that makes it a really valuable tool for researchers who are trying to understand the density of birds in certain areas or the timing of migration of birds, things like that. Um, so oh, is there a question? Yeah, I'm just going to admit somebody from the waiting room, I think. So that goes away. There we go. Um, so the other. Um, The other app I'm going to talk about is my other favorite, which is called iNaturalist. Um, and this is a partnership with the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic. Um, it was actually conceived by a couple of students doing a master's project at Berkeley. Um, they kind of invented this thing and it's now turned into this amazing global database. So this is for all of the other things. It, it can take data on birds as well, but literally any other living organism on the planet, you can submit a photo of it to iNaturalist and that piece of data gets documented and becomes available to scientists and, and conservationists. Um, so all living things. And the really cool thing about this is it uses artificial intelligence to suggest an initial identification of the creature that you've photographed. Um, so it's, it's really cool. <laughs> um, and not only that, but once you've submitted your observation, there's an instant kind of community of both amateur and professional naturalists that are there waiting to help you identify the thing that you photographed graphed and submitted. Um, and it's particularly good for kind of random one-off observations, a random dandelion lying on the pavement or a cool beaver that splashed in front of your canoe or something like that. You can, um, you can submit those data to iNaturalist. Um, so that's just a quick overview. I'll go into a little bit more detail um, as we go through. Um, so um, I just want to emphasize that everyone can help. This is, you do not need to be a scientist. You do not need to know anything about biology or any of these things. You can report anything that you see, um, any living wild thing to, to eBird or iNaturalist. You really don't need to be an expert. Um, and you don't have to wait until you see something that you think is rare and exciting. Um, documenting even common wildlife is actually really important too because we can learn a lot about how the world is changing around us from documenting changes in, in some of the commoner species. Um, and if, if we detect declines in common, it allows us to do the right thing. It allows us to act before it's too late to, to reverse some of those declines. Um, and also it's worth bearing in mind that especially as a perhaps a backcountry canoeist, then you have the privilege of seeing things that are actually quite rare and unusual because you are able to visit their habitats, for example. And you might not necessarily realize how valuable your data might be. And also um, to get to the, the, the crux of this, um, many of us are at least hoping to get into some really deep wilderness sometimes. And those places are really expensive and difficult to get to, as you know. Um, so they're often not inventoried very often by professional biologists. So anything you stumble across could actually be the first observation of that, that species in that area or in that park or in that, at that latitude or something like that. Um, so don't, don't ever think that your, your data isn't important enough. It, it really could be. So, so how do I do it? Um, so I've got a couple of slides that are fairly details oriented. So if you really don't ever want to do this, you can switch off for a couple of minutes and hopefully wake up again in a second. Um, so if you want to play around with eBird, then you go to the website eBird.org, just Google it, you'll find it. Create an account for yourself. 
And if you want to use a smartphone, then download the app to your smartphone, log in, open the app and start birding, like start looking at birds and start documenting all of the birds that you can see. And you, you should enter every species that you can identify either by sight or sound. So if you see a robin on your front lawn or you hear a robin singing in the tree behind your house, then both of those observations would count. That would be two robins, for example. Um, once you're, if you're not using a smartphone, then if you're out and about birding, take a notebook or something, document the time, the date and the location of when you start your, your birding. Write down the species that you see and how many of each that you see and document as well if you were standing in one spot or if you were moving around. And if you're moving around, then document how far you traveled because that information is also really important. Um, so document all of those things. Um, and once you're back home, back with computer access to the internet, then log in and then type in each of those checklists and submit the data to eBird. Um, and regardless of how you do it, then keep your checklist pretty short. Even as, as little as four minutes is enough to kind of quickly document what's around and about you. Um, checklists that go on for the whole day or multiple days are, are much less valuable in terms of data for, for researchers. Um, so keep them pretty short. Um, and if you're changing, if you're canoeing away and you're changing between habitats and maybe you're spending some time going through a wetland and then you need to cross a lake or go around the lake shore, then you'll see very different birds in those two, two different habitats potentially. So it's worth starting a new checklist each time you change habitats. You can also, if you just happen to be paddling along, see a, a nice loon or something, you can be like, oh, there's a loon. And you can just document that as an incidental observation in eBird as well. So for iNaturalist, it's pretty much the same deal with a few interesting twists. So again, Google iNaturalist and set up an account. I should mention these are completely free. Um, you don't need to spend any money on this. Um, if you want to use the smartphone app, download the smartphone app, log in, open up the app and take a photo of a butterfly or a plant or whatever it is you want to see, a moose in your wetland that you're paddling by. Um, take a photo, check that the app has actually documented where you are. So you need to make sure the GPS in your phone is, is turned on and is actually active. Um, if you're not using a smartphone, then um, ideally you'll have a camera. So take a photo of whatever it is you want to document. And again, like with eBird, document the time, the date, and the location of each photo. And when you're home, log in and upload each photograph to a separate observation and enter all of that information that you hopefully wrote down in your, your handy notebook. Um, at this point, regardless of how you've got the data, um, click on what did you see and the artificial intelligence thing will kick in and it will start suggesting species that you might have documented. So if you have a photograph of a butterfly, um, first of all, you probably know that it's a butterfly. So iNaturalist will tell you it's a butterfly, but then if you keep scrolling down, it will give you a, a, a suggestion of which species of butterfly it is. And the further down you can go, the better. Um, at that point, submit your observation. And then just wait for the magic to happen. Um, check back on that observation every few days, every few weeks, and send over time or two in some cases. Um, but normally here in North America, people are pretty active on iNaturalist and people will, will be logging in and they'll see your observation and they'll see that it's not been identified. And if they know what it is, they will suggest what, what the species is. Um, so that's just a quick overview of how those two things work. Um, just going to um, give you some more tips and tricks. So for iNaturalist in particular, well, actually, no, for everything, again, I've, I know I've said this before, everyone can contribute. You don't have to be an expert. You can be literally anywhere on the planet and document a cool creature and stick it into iNaturalist or eBird. Um, and all, all you have to do is start taking photos of cool things that you see out and about in your travels. Um, a few tips to make it a bit more valuable, both for you and to the science community, if you like. If you're trying to identify plants, then try to take several photographs of the plant. Um, take a photo of the flower, take a photo of the leaves, and try and take a photo of the whole plant as well, because all of these features can be really important for people to be able to identify it. Um, and I know we have at least one expert botanist in the 
in the audience in the form of my friend Ellen, um, and she will be the first to tell you, I'm sure, that you, you need to work out the arrangement of the leaves and whether the stem is a long stem or a short stem and where the flower is arranged and all of those things. So um, don't, just, don't just stick to one picture. Same with butterflies, there's a lot of information on the underside of the wings and on the upper side. So um, if you're in southern Ontario like me, you'll probably start seeing these butterflies right now. These are eastern commas. Um, I had one in my garden just yesterday. Um, they actually spend the winter as adults in leaf litter and things like that. So they're flit flitting around right now. Uh, so you can pop out in the next sunny day and try and grab a photo of one of these guys and, and iNaturalist will help you help you work it out. Um, so again, similarly with, with um, other insects and vertebrates in general, then take a few angles. Um, many of you, if you're paddling through wetland areas, you'll probably come across all sorts of really cool dragonflies and damselflies. So they can be tricky to photograph, especially with a cell phone, but if you're able to get a photo of their eyes, that's a really important identifying feature for dragonflies and damselflies. Um, similarly, the back end, the tail end, the business end um, is worth trying to get a, a photo of that as well. So just a few tips to try and try and kind of help with, with some of those things. Speaking of which, here's a arbitrary pretty dragonfly that I found in Algonquin, which I learned afterwards was apparently a frosted white face. So a naturalist has been a good way for me to learn some animals that I, I hadn't already, didn't already know. Um, so what is all this for? I mean, I've told you a little bit about what you, how you do it, but you know, why should you bother? Who cares? Um, so ultimately, these data are used for us all to collectively better understand the natural world all around us. Um, as a, although I am a professional biologist, I, I'm not, you know, a taxonomist. I'm, I'm not a very good botanist. I'm not really very good at butterflies. I'm not really very good at plants. All these things, um, but I've just done this for fun, and my observations have been used for things. So I was privileged to be able to go to Trinidad and Tobago. It was one of my last international trips pre-COVID. And I took a random photo of a pretty butterfly and shoved it in an naturalist. And it turns out that um, a gentleman from the, um, the naturalist club emailed me and asked if I, he could use my photo in his little field guide that he was making. Um, the, someone from Algonquin Park reached out. This um, moose observation of mine, if you see uh, his his back end, there's a whole bit of the leeches as a separate iNaturalist observation. And um, there's a gentleman that was wanting to write an article about leeches and wanted to use the photo in, in his publication. Um, similarly, I, I documented some non-native invasive Phrygmites and that contributed to an Ontario Parks control project as it turned out. So you don't need to be an expert to do these things. And sometimes you'll never know what your data may have contributed to, but it, it will all contribute to something. Um, and so you can see a little bit about how it works here actually is that, so I submitted this photo of this moose and I obviously knew it was a moose, so I suggested it's a moose and then you can see two or three other people <laughs> fortunately confirmed to me that it was in fact a moose, um, no surprises there. Um, and over on the right here there's some other little bits of details that you can capture which I would en encourage you to try, you can document if it's alive or dead in this case that's on the road or something like that then it's useful to actually stipulate whether or not it was alive or dead so sadly as you many of you know we see lots of dead snakes and turtles and things like that on roads and if you actually use this little drop down to say that it was dead then that can be a really valuable signal to conservationists that something needs to be done at this spot also if you know if it was a male or a female or what life stage it was at things like that is worth throwing throwing that information into um, it's also a really good source of photos for presentations. So all the photos in this presentation are mine. Um, but if you're ever having to give a talk or illustrate something, then hop on iNaturalist and eBird and have a look for photos of the, the species that you're interested in. Um, and you'll be able to get information if you click on the little information button just under the moose's nose. Um, you can get information about what permissions um, the observer has given for how you can use that photograph. So that's just another little tip too as to what it might be for. It's also really great information on 
how people are visiting the natural world. Um, as I mentioned already, that's obviously really important right now. There's many conservation land managers like myself and my colleagues at the Nature Conservancy of Canada are really struggling to work out how to better manage all of the people that are trying to visit the natural world. And community science platforms like these are, are part of the, a large toolkit to better understand how people are, are using the world. Um, so the next slide I just want to show you is a really cool animation um, that I stole from Cornell from the eBird stuff. And it's a mixture of radar and eBird data and I think a few other things. And it basically documents the migration of this little bird. So if you look at the orange bits at the bottom and the dates that are changing at the top, this is a little bird called a magnolia warbler that hangs out eating pests from our coffee in Central America all winter. And right now it's about to do that. It's about to migrate all the way up through the eastern seaboard and all the way through the Great Lakes and right up to the boreal where it breeds. And it spends the summer there singing its little heart out in the trees, um, raising little nests full of cute little baby magnolia warblers. And then boom, in the fall it flies all the way back down south. You know, we're all out there documenting it on our smartphones or on our notebooks and there it's, it's all over again. It's back in Central America eating pests on coffee plants. Um, so this is, this is a combination of eBird data that's been submitted by people like you and I from their phones, their computers, and some other technology like radar and things like that. So it's an incredibly powerful way of understanding the timing of migration and exactly where birds like this actually migrate and therefore how conservationists like I can best work out what land to protect and how to manage it to, to keep this cool phenomenon going. Um, so I really like this. I could kind of watch it on loop all day. It's kind of therapeutic, I find. Um, and although we use the term science, we use, we use research science, these terms can be off-putting for, for people. You, you really don't have to be an expert to do this. And I, I, I know I'm saying this a lot, but I really want to emphasize that. Um, it can be a great family activity. These are my little nieces that visited from New Zealand a few years ago. And we, we did some birding through the window, even though it was cold and miserable outside. And um, if you have a bird feeder set up in the garden, for example, or on your balcony, then you can submit an eBird checklist from the comfort of your living room, if you like. Um, you can go eye naturalizing in your yard. If you have a cool moth that flies onto your window at night, you can grab a photo of it and stick it onto iNaturalist. Um, and you can take this hobby with you. You can take it to the cottage. You can take it on vacation. You can take it to the mall. You can take it to the back country, which is what I'll be talking about shortly. Um, and just an example of this, um, this is a bird that someone photographed and submitted to iNaturalist. And, and I think this person, they, I think by their own admission, they're not, they weren't a birder. They didn't really know what they were looking at. They just took a picture of a cool bird that they saw in Rondo Provincial Park in southwestern Ontario a few years ago. Turns out this is the first record for this bird ever in Canada. Um, it's a bird that should be in the tropics. That's normally where it is. Those of you that have maybe been to places like Costa Rica in the winter and years gone by, you'll have seen these all over the place. It's a great kiskadi. Um, but there was one showed up in Rondo and someone randomly snapped a picture and chucked it on iNaturalist. And basically the entire birding community of Ontario descended upon Rondo Provincial Park to see this bird. So you never know what you're gonna see and you don't have to be an expert to find something truly remarkable like this. Um, so another arbitrary picture, pretty picture of a, a white washer lily that I found in Algonquin. Those of you that time will know very well. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, about prevent about the naturalist projects in Ontario parks specifically. Now I know some of you are calling in from not in Ontario, so this isn't necessarily directly relevant, but there are similar things that exist um, throughout iNaturalist depending on where you are. So if you submit information to iNaturalist from inside a provincial park, then it will automatically get pulled into this project that they've set up in iNaturalist. Um, and I should mention actually that the Nature Conservancy of Canada has also done the same thing in Ontario. We've created a project just like this. And if you go to iNaturalist, you can actually look um, on the website, look up the provincial parks and work out how many um, species have been seen in each park and work out 
you know, which, which, which is the top park. So as you can see, Algonquin Provincial Park, whenever I did the screen capture a little while ago, has by far the highest number of, of species that people have submitted to iNaturalist, 51 and a half thousand species. Um, so if you look up your favorite provincial park in Ontario, you can work out, especially if it's one of the ones way further down the list, how many observations do you need to make this summer to bump your favorite park up this species leaderboard a little bit? And you can play around on the website and you can look at it by observations, you can look at it by species, you can look at it by observers, you know, it's, it's actually really powerful. Um, and as I say, you can work out how you can boost your park up the leaderboard a little bit if you like. Um, so, and for example, when I was in Quetico last year, I thought, I looked this up beforehand, I thought, hey, there's hardly any observations in Quetico, I'm going to fix that. And so I did, I took, I made 200, 12 observations during my nine days um, and I became and just doing a bit of a random self aggrandizement here that I'm now the top observer and also saw the most species and I'm particularly proud of the fact that I managed to get poison ivy up into the top 10, 10 most observed species on the, in the park which I'm sure the park superintendent wasn't very pleased with me about but there you go it was kind of fun. Um, it, there isn't actually that much poison ivy in Quetico it's just whenever I saw it I documented it because I thought future people might care about that kind of thing. Um, <coughs> there you go. Um, so I observed over two, made to over 200 observations, 129 species, um, and it was a whole lot of fun. Um, and next year, we're planning a trip to Wabakimi. I'm sure some of you might be as well. There's only been 290 observations made on iNaturalist in Wabakimi. So whomever else might be going to Wabakimi next year, let's collectively see if we can fix that. And see what else we can find and see what cool things we can we can pop up onto that most observed species list. Um, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about one other and one other um, project that's that's happening starting right now in fact, in fact starting back on the 1st of January which is the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, so again apologies to those of you that aren't in Ontario and might be struggling to get to Ontario this year but um, the Breeding Bird Atlas is a five-year project, so it started this year, and again, it's, it's almost exclusively dependent on volunteers. Um, there have been two previous atlases happened. Um, the last one finished in 2005, um, and this is an opportunity for people to get out and help document where birds are actually breeding, so where birds are actually stopping, spending time um, building a nest, raising chicks, getting chicks off the nest. Um, and these data are incredibly important for guiding environmental policies and conservation strategies that professionals like me can then implement to, to help conserve birds that are, are declining. This is a way that we can discover who is declining and also what we can do about it. Um, so there's tons and tons of information on the website. I would encourage you to Google Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas and, and, and do some digging around on there. And if you are a birder in Ontario over the next five years, then I would encourage you to sign up as a volunteer. Um, and again, there, there's yet another app for that. There's an app you can download that, that feeds data straight into the Breeding Bird Atlas um, data vaults, if you like. Um, so you can, once you register as a volunteer, you can then um, download that app and start contributing data from anywhere in Ontario. Um, you can read a bit more about it. There are specific ways that the whole province is divided up to better manage data, but I'd encourage you to, to read about it there. Um, and this is a much more in-depth science presence absence data that you can get from eBird and iNaturalist. This is asking you to document some extra things about the birds. So if you're a bird that is trying to raise chicks, one of the things that you will often do is that you'll be seen like the song spiral perched with a bunch of food in your mouth. So that's a really good piece of data to submit to the Breeding Bird Atlas. You saw a bird carrying food. That means it's probably got a nest nearby or it's got some, some chicks hanging out. Similarly on the, the right, obviously this merganser has got little cute little babies. These are the kind of things that you will see the summer wherever you are out and about canoeing. Um, and it's worth worth documenting that because again, all of these data points are actually really kind of important. Other things are, you know, if, if you're in the right place at the right time of year for that species, if it's singing, then that suggests that the bird is probably holding a territory. He's trying to attract a mate, something 
I like that. So that's also an important data point. You might see a bird carrying a stick, that probably means he's going to build a nest. Um, so all of these things are, are things that, that you might be privileged enough to see in cool places. So look out for it. Um, so my last section, I'm just about done here, um, is some tips and tricks from a gear perspective. Now, I know if any of you are like my husband, you're absolutely obsessed with gear for the wilderness. Um, so here's your, your, your gear section. Um, just kind of laying out what we've done, um, not just for canoeing, but in, in general backcountry kind of situations. How do we make this work? How do we, how do we keep this stuff going? Um, so for those of you that are using smartphones and are, are prepared to, to use them for this, um, my recommendation is when you're off grid, then keep it on airplane mode, stick it on battery saver mode. There's a few things like that, depending on your phone that can help you really conserve power um, so you're not having to recharge it sometimes for several days at a time depending on how good your, your battery is. Just make sure if you do that that the GPS is still enabled because a lot of the functionality that I've been talking to you about does depend on the GPS still functioning. Um, and you can submit data when you return back to cell phone connectivity or, or back to your home Wi-Fi or whatever. Um, so you can keep gathering all of this information on the phone and as long as you don't drop it in the swamp then you'll have all that data for when you get home and you can submit it to eBird now naturalist when you get home. Um, bring some, you know, depending on the length of your trip, you may need to recharge your phone, of course. Um, so we used one of these external battery pack things. We carried a couple of them with us in Quetico and that was, that was enough for our, our nine day trip. Um, next year, we, we're gonna try a solar charging system because we're planning a rather longer trip. So we, probably can't carry enough extra batteries um, to help with that. I strongly recommend if you're going to use your phone like I've been using it, get yourself a lanyard. Um, so get it so that you can attach it to yourself or your bag or your, your boat or whatever. Um, and do something so that when you drop it in the lake that it doesn't then die. So my phone is fairly waterproof as it turns out, but you can get various cases and things that will help keep the, the lake out of the important parts. Um, the cat does not come canoeing with us, unfortunately, but he really wanted to model for this photo. So you get an arbitrary picture of my cat. Um, so yeah, this is the solar system that we purchased for playing in the back country next year. So we'll see how that works. I'll report back in a year if you want to know. Um, if you're not gonna use um, the smartphone to document things, then I'd recommend something like a write in the rain waterproof notebook. Again, you'll probably want to have it on a lanyard or something like that so you don't, don't lose it. Something nice and brightly colored like this is also a good idea so that you, when you put it down, that you don't then, it doesn't then turn into the background color. If you're using a camera that's external to your phone, then what I started to do is I would take my photo with my fancy camera and then I'd use my smartphone to take a photo of the back of the camera with iNaturalist so that I documented the, the place and the date and the time that I was making the observation with the big camera. And then when I get home, I could, um, I have no idea why there's a red stripe, stripe on my, my slide there. Anyway, um, once I get back, then I would process all of the good photos from my camera, submit the observations from my phone, and then log in and switch the crappy back of camera photos with the proper photo from my camera. I don't know if that made sense, but <coughs> you can always ask me about that later if it didn't. Um, this or the, there is no obligation to take a fantastic photo of any of these things. You can take a remarkably crappy cell phone shot of something and it will still be identifiable and still therefore be useful data. Um, I'm lucky in that we got ourselves set up with, with some nice cameras a few years ago, and I did take this with me on all of my canoe trips last year. Um, so people often ask me, how do you trip with a DSLR? So this is what I've been doing. I have it on a strap. It lives inside this holster thing, which gives it some padding. And then it sits in this handy dandy mech tote bag that I have, which is basically a dry bag. Um, and whenever things get a bit sketchy, if the weather's crappy or the, the waves are wavy or whatever, then I have it all battened down and carabinered onto the canoe. Um, 
But when we're kind of paddling around in a wetland or something where I'm trying to photograph things, then I have it a bit more accessible, but it's still all nicely padded and, and waterproof in there. Um, and I have a, a, an auto steer in the form of my husband that um, makes the canoe go where it needs to go so I can get a nice photo of the bird or whatever it is without drowning. So that's a handy addition to your kit if you, if you have a, another person that can steer. Um, and with that, I think that is me done. Um, so I hope you took something from that and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about either a naturalist or eBird or natural history in general or how I did it in the back country or any of those things. So I will pass it back to Gary, I think, to see if there's any okay. questions. Thank you. Uh, so we can go back to non-sharing and then people can uh, sure. you know, pose a question, uh, maybe go. put their hand up and then we'll go one by one through whatever questions, or if you have any comments, uh, feel free to offer, you know, suggestions. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the first question. Okay. The equipment you have, I mean, that's always the, the issue is trying to keep the water out of the equipment. Um, have you ever had an issue where you had an oops on the equipment? <laughs> um, the worst that we've, uh, done and I think Brent my husband did it a couple of times he dropped his phone into the water or yeah. when we're having to lift the canoe over at Beaver Dam or something like that he forgot and it was in his pocket and he ended up yeah. getting wet and we both have Google Pixel phones and they're actually waterproof in that context okay, and we yeah. always have them lanyard on so we even if they get wet they're still attached to us um Next year, well, I guess this year, we're planning some river trips where there might be some easy rapids and things involved. We've been on a few training courses and such like. So it'll be interesting to work out how we how we operate things then. I'm not expecting to have the DSLR out while I'm trying to navigate in a rapid, but we'll we'll see how that how that goes. <laughs> we might we might portage the camera gear and then paddle the rapid. <laughs> All right, let's open it up to everybody else. So just turn your camera on and then put your hand up. Uh, we do have a question from Gary James originally. If you go back to the chat. Oh, yeah. About uh, nest locations. Know, so Gary, if you can uh, come on or Jerry and just ask your question. Yeah, hi, it's Gary calling. Hey. iNaturalist. Uh, I was uploading all my photos and I wanted to promote iNaturalist to my friends. Yeah. I created a list of or a life list of all my photos. I went to share it and it turns out they've changed them. They're not my photos. So I just wondered if you had experienced this and if you know a workaround or how to get so I can share my photos and promote iNaturalist. So, um, so do you mean that you've uploaded photos to iNaturalist and then you've found that you don't have the permissions to those photos anymore? Is that what you mean? I'm not sure I'm quite understanding your question. In iNaturalist, there is a, a new tab or bar section that's that your list of all the photos you've taken. Oh, I, and, right. Yeah, I think. Break it down yeah. by saying, I've taken this many birds, this many turtles, yep. this many whatever. Yeah, And I thought this would be a great way to share it with my neighbors and my other canoe buddies here of what right. I've seen on my trips. And I went to share it and then realized they're all stock photos. Those are not my photos. Yeah, I see what you mean. So I meant to mention this as well, actually, that um, one of the cool things about iNaturalist and eBird is that documents it documents all of the things you've ever submitted to it. So it tells you how many birds you've seen in your life in the world or in Canada or in Ontario or in Middlesex County or whoever it is. Same for iNaturalist. Um, but the problem in iNaturalist that I think you're describing is if you want to see all of your stuff, you can see all of the species that you see, but it uses, you know, a random photo to illustrate that species. So <clears throat> I'm not sure. You're frozen, I think. Getting. I you, have? Uh, you were frozen and we missed all that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what I can do about that. Yeah, you just um, missed a couple seconds. Start again. Okay, okay sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how to, how to address your question. You may just have to share links to the individual observations that you've made. 
so that people can see your photos rather than the stock photo. Um, but yeah, I, you, you, it might not quite have that functionality that you're looking for. If you're looking for it as a way to show your photos to your family and friends, I'm not sure it's, it's quite well set up to do that. Yeah, like yeah. you're going up to Wabakimi. Mm -hmm. We were there, Gary and I and a few others in Wabakimi a couple yep. of years ago. If you wanted to go, if I wanted to share my photos through iNaturalist with you, I can't do that. I can search for your username and see all of your observations on iNaturalist and yeah. see your photos that way potentially. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. It's not, it's not really designed for that. It's more designed to gather data for you know, research purposes. Um, so, but I see where you're, where you're coming from. It, it'd be nice if it, the same with eBird, if it did just a few more tweaks and it was a bit more like a, a Facebook for sharing natural history imagery. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, whoever's next, put their hand up. Okay. Angie Williams. I did not have a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have um, suggested an answer to somebody's question, though. Okay, why don't you yeah, pose I see it? There's, I see there's some questions in the chat about nest locations, and that is something I would really emphasize is that um, whatever you're doing, if you're trying to document a bird or an animal through either of these apps then, or just by photographing it, then make sure that the welfare and future of that animal is your highest priority. Um, don't chase the animal to get the shot. Don't harass the bird get shot I mean I'm it's probably I hope it's stating the obvious but um, it, it can be quite a slippery slope between trying to get that shot and actually leaving the animal alone and obviously in the case of things like bears and moose then you're putting yourself at risk as well as the animal if you're getting too close and harassing it um, nesting birds are really vulnerable to being disturbed by you and even if you think you're being really careful you can end up leading a predator to that nest and then it's it's chomp 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 for the chicks um, so if you're somewhere really remote, then the chances of you documenting a nest and that data being used by a person who would then be less ethical than you and disturb that nest is probably fairly remote. But if you're documenting sensitive wildlife somewhere where there are more people, then you might want to either delay when you submit those data. Um, so su submit them after the end of the breeding season so that the bird has had a chance to feed its and do all that stuff submit so if you find a you know a nest in the, the spring then submit that data in august when the birds have gone um would be my advice um if the birds and i see angie's already responded to some of these things but just for the benefit of the whole group um if you do find a, a species at risk or something that is deemed sensitive in other ways then often ebird or a naturalist will automatically obscure the location of those animals um, so all of the turtles in Ontario are classified as a species at risk, for example, and one of the reasons they're a species at risk is because people poach them um, and take them home and sell them into the pet trade and things. Um, so some of the rarer turtles, um, you can look up observations on our naturalist. They're completely obscured to try to prevent that kind of activity from, from happening as easily as it could through, through our naturalist. Um, it's not the case for everything though. So if you're in doubt, then it's always worth either posting though, if you have a bird nest and you, you really want to post it now, you don't want to wait for whatever reason, then post it at a, you know, a rough county level or something like that. Same with iNaturalist, like obscure the, and I think you can choose to obscure the coordinates, coordinates of it in iNaturalist as well. So. Um, All right, we've got a few, a few hands like up. Uh, the next hand is for oh. Lisa and Doug. Hey. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I think you partially answered my question already. Um, how long can you delay posting something? So my question would be, can I take a plant picture that I did in Quetico last summer and put it up there now? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I have great plans to submit data to iNaturalist from to, yeah. 
Um, so the, the best time to do it is, is right now when you're thinking about it, but any time is fine. Um, they'll, they'll use data. The thing that happens with, um, especially in eBird, is if you submit something without a photo or without a description because it was 10 years ago and you've forgotten, in my case, um, then sometimes local reviewers will email you and say, are you sure about that? You know, it's a bit unusual for that area. And the longer you wait, then the more likely you are to have forgotten that kind of detail. Yeah. Um, so it's always worth getting it done right away. But yeah, there's no, there's no time limit. People are, people are backfilling data from their whole lifetime sometimes. So there's really cool stuff appearing from decades and decades ago on some of these platforms, which is kind of cool. Yeah. All right, next is uh, Tom. Tom, do you have a question? There we are. Uh, your sound is really breaking up, I'm afraid. I can't make out any detail. Oh, and I think you you might be on mute, actually, Tom. I'm not hearing you. No, he's not on mute. No, he's not. Is he? but we can't hear you, Tom. Uh, maybe you can type your message in the chat. And then we'll read it out loud. Uh, while we're waiting for Tom, Christopher Mayberry's got a question. Hi, uh, thank you. Really appreciate Hi. it. Um, uh, yeah, just can you hear me. Uh, sorry, we've got Tom trying. You're also breaking up, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Um, try try closer to the mic. Hello. Uh, you might have to type, Christopher. I'll send oh, it I... in the chat. I'll send it in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else can put their hand up and I... are waiting for the chat to fill up. Um, anyway, I was saying. Uh, oh, Christopher's uh, back. Okay. I think I'm clear. Yeah. Um, recently, I've been uh, down a couple of the local rivers, and, and um, I noticed that the kill horse this year, I, last few years, I've sort of thought that they've been disappearing. Um, does eBird or iNaturalist take a census? Like, I think I've counted over 40. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm quite impressed, and I haven't seen that for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. So, so basically, the way eBird and iNaturalist works is that whomever, like a, a scientist, might decide, oh, I need to study killdeer, and they'll look up all of the data that's been submitted to eBird and iNaturalist, and they will kind of collate all of the information. So every time you submit a checklist that has killdeer on it, then those checklists would become available to the researcher. So the the uh, that is the, the best way you can contribute to people understanding kind of collectively how populations of certain species are changing is each time you see a kill deer stick on a checklist and do your best to count around and put a picture understanding of it. Um, but the Breeding Bird Atlas in Ontario um, is aimed at doing a much more careful census and documentation of exactly where all of the birds are actually breeding as well. So something you might see with things like killdeer is that they're, they're a migratory bird. Um, they just arrived back in southwestern Ontario, well, throughout Ontario now, but you know, about three or four weeks ago, maybe. Um, so right now, there's huge numbers of birds that are arriving back from migration. And sometimes you get huge assemblages of them because maybe the weather's turned or the wind has turned around from the north or something, and they'll pause in their migration. So sometimes for a whole bunch of what apparently random weather related reasons you'll see huge number huge aggregation and other years you won't see that so it can partly be driven by habitat changes sometimes because of things that we're doing to the landscape but also it can be you know weather events that have changed migration patterns for that particular year and over time with thousands and thousands of checklists from people like you and I then scientists can kind of separate out what are the actual trends versus what is just a local weather event or a you know annual oddity mm -hmm. yeah. the um the killdeer I, I take are in place now i've noticed them from kettle creek up to Venastra um and on the nith and whatnot the other thing i noticed were um 15 or 20 tundra swans on the nith the other day and i i, I took note of it because i don't yeah. think i've seen them on a river before usually right. 
it's on a on a field out near in between Stratford yeah. or something. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so and I so they're in in transition, I assume, going up to uh, the Calouid or something. So yeah, exactly. That would, yeah, in that case, that would be their location on their journey. For sure, and that's really valuable as well because although it's important to protect breeding habitat, it's important to protect wintering habitat. It's also important to protect migratory habitat. So, mm -hmm. birds are you know they need all of those three areas to survive. So if we know how they're migrating and what bits of the landscape they're using, then we can work out how best to conserve them. So yeah, absolutely documenting things, you know, regardless of the time of year and what they're up to is, is all valuable. All right, cheers. Yep, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I see right, Tom we have a has question oh. in the chat from Tom. Mm -hmm. Any good iPhone telephone lenses for bird photos from a distance? And mm -hmm. it's just saying, sorry, you had a bad yeah. little connection. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm not sure. My guess is probably yes, that there probably are telephoto lenses you can add on to an iPhone. Um, the other trick that I've seen people do, I haven't really had much success myself because I'm not very good at it, is to, if you have a pair of binoculars, you can actually hold your phone up to your binoculars and take a photo yeah. through your binoculars. Um, or if you even have a telescope, you can do the same thing. Um, but if you don't have any of those things, then I, I think there might be some little attachments that you can put onto phones. But yeah. um, I don't know if there's anyone else in the audience that might know an answer to that, or you can do some creative Googling and see what you can find. But I think there's a good chance that there will be something you'll find. All right, Angie. All right. Um, I don't have a question, but I wanted just to add on something about the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. Hi. Hi, cool. Mary, we were emailing. Yeah, Bye. great, thanks, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for doing this. So for people who are, are interested in birds, even if you're not you know, an expert, but if you have some backcountry trips planned in Northern Ontario in the next five years, um, my husband and I, have done a few canoe trips explicitly for the purpose of doing the breeding bird atlas in Atlas II and also a couple trips in Manitoba for their breeding bird atlas. It's a fantastic way to do a canoe trip and there's some assistance available sometimes um, to help you get there and get back and such. So that's kind of a neat thing. If you're not an expert but you're going somewhere that is a little bit remote that's hard for researchers to get to, we have a certain number of recording devices that canoers can take and just turn them on and let them run for a while. And when you bring them back, then some an expert will listen and can document birds' sounds from those recording devices. So that's something that we're looking at this year with the, uh, or this next five years with the bird atlas. That is an opportunity, even if you're not an expert identifying birds, you can still help in a very big way. I will say though that with COVID, um, we're being told this year to not really encourage people to come up north and do trips um, into remote areas. But over the next four years, I think that's going to open up again. So just wanted to pass that along. Okay. For sure. Um, Angie, you can type the website that you were talking about in the chat. Okay, I think that you know, Mary And then that way we have a record and people can, like I said, the chat will be on the back end of the video. So it'll be yeah, okay. about that. Yeah. Thank you. Would... Any other do that. comments, questions? No, I actually meant to naturalist. Andy Bird, you can, um, oh, I was just gonna say that you can actually upload sound recordings to eBird and iNaturalist as well, so. I talked a lot about taking photos, but you can also upload sound recordings. So, okay. good reminder. <laughs> okay, Christopher's got his hand up, I think, again. I'm not quite sure if that's a remnant. Uh, Christopher, do you have an another question? Nope, that was a remnant. That was okay. Chaotic. You can put your hand yeah. down, then. It's getting tired. <laughs> oh, oh <driver. laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Lower hand. There we go. There you go. 
All right, I guess that's it for the questions. Uh, I'd like to thank you for giving the presentation. It's excellent. And I thought it was a very interesting subject. Like I've, I've never done anything with really birds and stuff. So it makes it um, straightforward to do something. <laughs> and, you know. And yeah, the technology is pretty cool. It's, it's making yeah. a lot of things a lot more accessible than they, they used to be. Yeah. I have a question uh, about, um, thanks for the presentation. That was amazing. Oh, I already have been using iNaturalist for a couple hey. of years, but it was nice to hear it from a biologist perspective. Um, and I tried eBird, but I felt it was prohibitive to someone who's trying to learn how to identify things. But I think they've changed, like you talked about the incidental category. Hmm. So that feels a little more accessible right. to someone looking right. It, it's a bit tricky and I, it's, it's tough in COVID, but um, the best thing to do that I can suggest is try to find someone that has a bit more experience than you to that you can kind of go out with and learn from and build your confidence that way. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really it is meant to me to be able to ID things, but try you should try out the Merlin app. Um, so just Google Merlin bird ID because it's actually linked to eBird now. Um, and I've never actually used it, but I think it, it allows you to say if you saw a bird that was black and white with a long tail or whatever, then it will come up with some suggestions for you. Um, and also just buy a field guide. You can buy a, a nice bird book for, you know, 10, 15 bucks, I think, these days, especially if you can find a secondhand one. Um, so there's a bunch of resources out there and mm -hmm. people are usually pretty, pretty friendly to share their knowledge with you. So even if you have a really crappy cell phone shot of a blurry bird in the distance, then people will often be, be able to ID that or give you some tips as to what it might have been or, or give you tips on what to look out for next time. So it, it can feel a bit intimidating to get into, but you know, it's, it, it is amateur. It's meant to be set up for amateurs to get into. And even though I've always been interested in birds, I've got significantly better since I've been using eBird because I've kind of forced myself to listen for all of the birds and mm. actually check for all of the birds when I'm there because I want to submit a complete checklist. So I've made more effort to to build my own skills as best I can. So yeah, I don't know, just, just have a go. And unless you're reporting, you know, penguins and ostriches from Ontario, then you're probably, you're probably not going to screw anything up too badly. That's true. <laughs> At least you're seeing sparrows and robins. Um, I guess my question is about on iNaturalist, when you upload, I'm a little confused with the user interface sometimes, when you upload an observation and someone IDs it, uh, let's say I try to ID it, common loon, and then someone else, you know, maybe research grade, do I have to confirm it or like how does it work because it could be in this continuous thread of yeah um confirming right. what that you, you uh, shouldn't have right? to so basically it should automatically flip to research grade once it has enough IDs that are all the same okay. um so sometimes if you've su suggested something like you've said butterfly and then someone says morning cloak with a species then it won't flick to research grade until someone else also confirms that yes, it was a morning cloak or whatever. Um, so if you can go back in and say, see that someone has given a species and if you're like, oh yeah, of course, that's what it is. You can then say that's what it is underneath and then it will flick to research grade. And oh, I haven't okay. quite worked out all of the ins and outs of how that works myself either, but basically the more people confirm that yes, it was a monarch or yes, it was a moose, then at some point it will flip to research grade all by itself. Um, and if it doesn't, you can always, I don't know, bribe a friend to log in and, <laughs> and confirm it for you. And be like, yeah, that is a moose or is a monarch or something. So. Well, I followed you just now, so I'm cool. going to be, uh, I'm going to invite yeah. you at some point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're, you're totally welcome. I mean, I, I'm not very good at actually IDing stuff on iNaturalist. Like I'm, I'm primarily a birder and I'm learning other stuff. Um, so I'll, I'll often ID birds, but there's a lot of botanists that are way better than I am, that I kind of rely on them to do the proper botany stuff. Um, but yeah, feel free to either send stuff to me or, or tag me in something and I'll do my best. And yeah, I won't bombard you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no worries. I, I can say about uh, the northern trips. Right, yeah, okay, up, so that's you. Cool. I went up to uh, Woodland Caribou Provincial Park. Oh, nice, I'm very jealous. <laughs> walking along a portage, full pack, 
sat down for a break, noticed that there were some swallowtails on the ground, yep. pulled out my camera, took a picture of it. Off I go. COVID time. I'm getting around now to it five years later, uploading it. The controversy over these butterflies. Yep. Where was it? What portage? Because the photos were good, but I called them an eastern swallowtail, right. eastern tiger swallowtail. And oh, no, no, they got to be great Canadian swallowtails. Right. I don't know. <laughs> Where was it? What portage? And it's like, right. oh my God, like this is, don't care. They're not out there now. <laughs> It does. So, so partly for that, for those Crazy. those swallowtails, there is a lot of discussion right now about their taxonomy, and I think they're they're trying to work out if there's more than one yeah. species going on. So I think that might be why that one has had so much attention. So yeah, you know, yeah, and Gary, I had another one down here in the Rouge Park right. too. <laughs> and sometimes I go back to the properties, and you could see the you know creation date of the photograph, and you could figure out from the time. Uh, you know, with all your photos, oh yeah, we broke camp at 8.30 and I got here at 9.35 and took this photo. So you know it's yeah. an hour. So you know where you were roughly, you know? You can kind of- Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I told the guy, I can tell you where yeah. I was for breakfast and where I was for dinner. <laughs> yeah. And like, these are my photos in this order. It's yeah. somewhere, but yeah. they wanted to know where. Yeah, yeah like, well, if you, <laughs> if you do a properties on the photo, when you open it will no the exact time. Yeah, it has the time, but it doesn't have the GPS location on. No, I agree, but you can kind of figure it out from where you start yeah. and when you end by the yeah. time. Yeah, because thank you very I, much. Like a story about my trip, I forget what was this portage. And yeah, exactly. Photographs. You know, yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah. But if it wasn't for COVID, I wouldn't be downloading all these. No, I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great couch yeah time. yeah and there's a lot of people that have been tapping into these yeah. things this year this last year thank so you very much for cool. the presentation very yeah. nice yeah, it was good